May I welcome Talmi Sahib. We are honored to have you here. I would like to welcome and please humko apni tajrubay se ab kuch humko bhi share karne dijiye, kuch humko bhi fayda uthane dijiye, jo chiz aapne hasil ki Saudi Arabia mein aur dusre mulko mein. Talmi Zahmat Sahib. Khwaja Shahid Sahib, distinguished guests on the podium, students of this great university, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be amongst you. It is always a pleasure to be with young people. Very often we learn from you because you have had extraordinarily diverse experiences. We these opportunities to speak to you are basically a communication of one's personal knowledge and experience. It is not the last word on any subject. These are personal interpretations based on one's own understanding. In a region like West Asia, these changes are happening almost daily and our assessments have to change accordingly. Therefore, what I am sharing with you is my understanding as it stands now. But this is a continuing process. Philosophers of education will say that education is a continuing process. So be it, with regard to the specific region that we will address today, it is also a continuing process. And I'll do my best to explain, interpret, suggest certain thoughts on what I believe has been happening in West Asia, our neighbor, a source of great influence on our civilization, and a partner, not only in the past, but a partner for several decades in the future. Indeed, it would not be an exaggeration to say that our destinies are linked and that mutual interest will drive our relationships forward for several decades to come. Jabbi mein haath uthaun, aap wo slide dikha dijega. It is important to go back. Whenever we have an issue, a region that we need to understand, we need to go back. As you know, history goes back several centuries. But let me pick up the thread just about a hundred years ago. And I begin with a quotation from the book, The Peace to End All Peace. This came out in 1989, just 26 years ago, by David Fromkin. It, it explains what happened after the First World War at Versailles. What happened during the war and what happened after the war. Just two years, two to three years, up to 1922, what happened a series of arrangements and agreements were put together by the Anglo-French Alliance, the victorious powers after the First World War, to reshape West Asia in order to subserve Western interests. And he has therefore squarely blamed, writing the book in the late 1980s, so many decades later, that the principal source of the problems that beset West Asia have their roots in the arrangements that were made at Versailles. The other quotation that I have given a little below that is an author who wrote in Financial Times just a few years ago, and he says that West Asia is the graveyard of ethical politics. It is with this background that I go into the region in detail. Without much ado, let me describe to you what the scenario was in West Asia in the second half of the last century and the beginning of this one. The most important aspect to note is that every country in the Arab world, from Morocco up to Yemen, was ruled by authoritarian regimes, some of them traditional monarchies and the others which were republican regimes. This is an extraordinary observation because 
Ever since India became free in 1947, country after country in Asia had adopted a democratic model. So too in the case of Latin America from the 1980s and all through the 1990s, Latin America threw off the yoke of military dictatorships and became democratic polities. After the Rainbow Nation emerged in South Africa, you found that in Africa too, the winds of change had started blowing, culminating most recently in democratic elections in Nigeria. But this extraordinary swath of territory, right from Morocco up to Yemen, saw no such change whatsoever. There is a reason for this. And the reasons lie in Versailles. The West recognized this region as extraordinarily important to its strategic interests, obviously due to oil. And oil is a strategic asset. The machinery of war, the machinery of industry, of transport, depends entirely on these resources. Therefore, Western policy, right from the First World War, had been that this region, so rich in oil, should continue to be dominated by Western interests. The second part of this interest was that no other hostile element should have a say in this region. And the third factor that emerged in Western strategic calculus was after 1948, the security of Israel. Therefore, the security of oil resources and the security of Israel became the two principal pillars of Western strategic interest in the region. It meant, therefore, that the regimes of this region had to be entirely beholden to Western interest. And this arrangement persisted. There used to be a give and take relationship, a relationship in terms of which Western powers would guarantee the security of the regimes. And in turn, these regimes would support Western strategic interests across the region. Most recently, recall what happened in Afghanistan. For the United States, it was one more proxy war against the Soviet Union as part of the Cold War. A global jihad was put together by its allies, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, to support this Western interest. The consequences of that jihad are still with us. But this is the way. Even later, when Saddam Hussein occupied Kuwait in 1990, a coalition was put together to support the Western intervention, military intervention. In 2003, when the United States planned to attack Iraq, the Gulf countries were opposed to it because they saw in this initiative an empowerment of Iran, which would now wield influence in Iraq. But once the United States decided that they were going to take military action, the Gulf countries fell in line and provided full logistical support to the American intervention. So this strategic partnership has not only uh, been cast in stone, it has actually been tested on the battleground decade after decade over the last few years. It therefore suited the Western alliance to have authoritarian regimes and to maintain the political status quo. And this is what explains why no winds of change occurred here. After the Cold War was over, there were certain Western scholars who emerged from the debris of the Cold War to suggest that there was something inherently flawed in Islam and the Arab people which made them unfit for a democratic order. Or that a democratic order required a certain coming together of values and principles and heritage which was entirely absent in the Arab world. This is a complete travesty. Over the last century and a half, the aspirations for popular participation have been very robust all across the Arab world. It is Western intervention working closely with local regimes that has ensured 
that the authoritarian system persists. But there were other aspects of disorder besides authoritarianism, and that was per continuous military failure. The failure of the Arab armies in 1948 and 1967 was seen as a defeat for the entire Arab community. Uh, coupled with this, you found sustained economic failure. That it is a thought which we could consider that would people accept an authoritarian system if it gave them economic success? This is something we will never know about. People point at China as a possible example. But in the Arab world, the, there was no indication of economic success either. Because an authoritarian system in, is inherently corrupt. Because the resources of the state have to be utilized to support the, uh, they have to support the cliques, the groups that are around the regime and sustain the regime. Therefore, you have a system which is called crony capitalism, in terms of which the ruler, has, I mean, the ruler at the center, is surrounded by people who benefit from the economic resources generated in the country. It means large sections of the community are left out of the advantages of economic progress, on the one hand, and there is rampant poverty and large-scale unemployment. These are the, this was the scenario that prevailed in the Arab world. Was the Arab world totally non-responsive to this? No, it was not. Rise emerging from the success of jihad in Afghanistan, a huge force was mobilized against authoritarian and military and Western interests. This was Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is not the product of jihadi writings and thinking of Sayyid Qutb or Maulana Maududi. It is directly a descendant of the Afghan jihad. This is something that is nowadays slurred over by Western writing. But do recall, and do accept this fact that Afghan jihad was the first global jihad put together in the 20th century after the First World War. But the call of the Sultan of Turkey for jihad had no resonance in the Muslim world. But this one did. 100,000 Muslims from every Muslim community in the world except for two, India and Oman. Only two Muslim communities did not participate in the jihad. Otherwise, 100,000 Muslims landed at the Pak Afghan border between 82 and 92. 50 percent of them may have been Pakistanis. There was a large group of Arab Afghans. But there was something even more significant that happened in Afghanistan. The jihad was successful. From the perspective of those who fought in the trenches of Afghanistan, they won. This was the first significant Muslim victory against a Western power in more than maybe 300 years. It signaled to the jihadis that the good Lord was once again with the Muslim people and that he would support them now that they were back on the right track. Afghanistan did more than that. It gave you not only victory and the destruction of the enemy in due course, the breakup of the Soviet empire, it created a cadre of trained personnel, personnel indoctrinated in jihad and trained in war. It, they were able to fan out across the world and to bring the message of jihad. But as, you, as the decade proceeded through the 1990s, sporadic acts of violence took place there was a coming together of Al-Qaeda and Taliban in Afghanistan after 1996, and jihad's actions culminated in the assault upon the United States in 9-11. And then it did not seem to have much resonance after that. 9-11 was the high point of jihad. After that, you found a large number of largely meaningless assaults. Numerous people being killed, women and children, many of them Muslims, with no strategic advantage accruing to the cause of Muslims. On the other hand, there were extraordinary disadvantages as well. More than a third of Muslim people live in non-Muslim countries. 
And in these countries, slowly but surely, there was the influence of what is now called Islamophobia. Muslims became stigmatized, connected with terror and violence. And, and they therefore had a difficult time in their adopted countries. By the time you come to the, towards the end of the decade, the first decade of this century, there was a sense, and I sensed that when I was in Abu Dhabi, that there was a certain exhaustion with regard to jihad, and that the broad popular support that jihad might have had among Muslim people at the beginning of the decade was petering out. And at that stage, you, there was a sense of emptiness, a sense that we are all waiting for something to happen. It was unclear what that would be. This was the answer. In December, it began in Tunisia in December 2010 and culminated a month later with the departure of the president who had ruled Tunisia for several decades. And abruptly, for the first time, I, who was in Riyadh at that time, realized that something extremely momentous had happened. No scholar, no politician, and no diplomat anticipated the Arab Spring. It can truly be defined as spontaneous. Today, when we look at scholarship, I have suggested to you with some humility that I had sensed a sense of emptiness at that time but I did not anticipate the Arab Spring. When Zain al Abidin bin Ali landed in Jeddah, I applied my mind because he landed in Jeddah and therefore as I joke with people that a Tunisian problem became my problem, that I had to take cognizance of his presence. And that is where it all began. From the middle of January onwards, there was an extraordinary atmosphere all across the Arab world. This world, which had been left behind by history and, and felt a deep sense of failure, political, military, social, cultural, and economic, suddenly felt a sense that something was possible. I struggled when I wrote my first dispatch from Riyadh. I struggled with words, how to express the extraordinary momentous events that were taking place around me at that time. And since my prose was limited, I went, to poet, I went to the tale of two cities. And if you see the first paragraph of the tale of two cities describing the extraordinary excitement of the French Revolution, I captured that essence. I thought that paragraph captured the essence of what was being experienced in the Arab world. And I used this. I began my dispatch with this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And then, of course, we have to take recourse to poetry. And I found this Tunisian poet who had written against colonialism. And I found what an extraordinary similarity this sentiment has with what Josh Maliabadi had written at the eve of the Indian independence, when he had said, Kya hin ka zanda kaap raha hai, gunj rahi hai takreere, uktaye hai shayad kuch kaidi, aur tod rahe hai zanjeere. This was the sentiment that one felt at that time. <laughs> what was it all about? After the excitement of prose and poetry, you come back to mundane aspects. Very often the term used is a reality check. What was it all about? It was due to the pervasive economic failure. An economic failure, and I want to stress to you the significance of this, unemployment. Unemployment robs you of your humanity and it robs you of your dignity. It diminishes you as a human being. The fact that you are unable to support yourself and your family members is the deepest humiliation. And here you have this man, Muhammad Bu Azizi, who is what we would call in India a thela wala, who is an illegal thela wala selling something. Two policemen come, one of them a lady, a lady policewoman. She gives him a tight slap. It seems as if 
the cup of humiliation has reached its limit and he goes and immolates himself. But what an extraordinary impact this single event has. Hundreds of thousands of people come out onto the streets and rebel against authoritarian rule and dictatorship. It is also balanced by the other aspect, the other reality of your political system, and that is corruption. That there is on the other side, that just as much as you are deprived, on the other side there is this said that there is a small coterie of people in my country who are living extremely well a life of gross self-indulgence and hedonism. And this is what was seen. And the moment you rebel against corruption and you demand a change in the economic order, you also simultaneously demand your participation in that country. You demand transparency and accountability. And that is where you come in and say that I must have a say in the political system that decides on the distribution of the assets of my country. I have given just one quotation. Day after day in the Saudi press, every aspect of that, there was an extraordinary joy. And no Saudi writer or Arab writer distinguished between the Gulf monarchies, the traditional monarchies and the Republican regimes. They were all seen as one that they all faced the same malaise and they faced the same challenges. What has happened? Very rapidly, four regimes fell. This was a product of the situation, the economic scenario, and the sense of defeat, sense of despair, and a sense of loss of control over destiny was pervasive all across the Arab world. There was a major role played by some by modern technology, social media. This humble mobile was used to mobilize support, to get people together, just through SMS messages. It was also a camera. It was also linked to you with the internet. And this was an extraordinary force for mobilization. The conventional grammar of political dissent was fundamentally transformed. Today you had a gathering of dissent which had no leadership, no political party, and no ideology. This was perhaps the first time in history, certainly in the Arab world, that such an overwhelming upsurge of opposition at the popular level was taking place. And it just showed that these regimes, which had looked so strong, and had been so hard and had used the instruments of violence and terror to sustain themselves year after year, decade after decade, were actually quite fragile. That once the instrument of straight power was, could not be used on the chests of millions of people who opposed you, you were seen as completely without any strength, without any value, without any backbone. This shows the fragility of an authoritarian system. That, yeah. where are we today? In Tunisia, initially you had elections. And Nahda was successful. It formed the government. There were very serious problems because they were inherited. There is no shortcut. You cannot solve social and economic problems overnight, even though you may be full of idealism. It takes a very long time. And Nahda did a, the, one of the wisest things in the world. They stepped down. There was a government of technocrats. And then they formed a constitution, which is the first free, first democratic constitution in a free environment in the Arab world, in the history of the Arab world. And there it is, Tunisia. In the case of Egypt, the narrative is slightly different. Yes, the Muslim League won three elections, one after the other. They became, uh, their, their nominee became the president of the country. And he was overthrown by the military in one year. Today we are able to see why this happened. There were two reasons, separate but finally had the same effect. The Muslim Brotherhood was not prepared for governance. Nothing in their previous 80 year history had given them any experience of governance. They'd always functioned underground. 
they had been incarcerated they had been uh, they had been tortured they had been executed they had been exiled they worked at grassroots level and that gave them a popular degree of support but they were highly doctrinaire and by the time you came to the responsibility of governance they were found seriously inadequate but their shortcomings were not threatening a democratic order could still have been sustained in egypt if they had been given the opportunity to correct their mistakes but that now brings you to the other aspect what they is now called or referred to as the deep state the deep state is these instruments of authoritarian power go deep into the bowels of the state and include the security forces the judiciary the, the security forces the bureaucracy the judiciary and the media they don't give up just because the top head has been knocked off they have everything to lose in a new order and it is they therefore ensure that they will not be uh, they were the bastion of support for regime change in egypt there was also an external element and certain countries of the gcc supported the overthrow of the democratically elected government since then egypt is under military dictatorship and we do not see any possibility it is very harsh on the brotherhood which it sees as its enemy this the same enemy that is seen uh, by the gcc countries and as a result today we do not sense any aspect of the arab spring which was so powerful in, in its resonance in cairo and in other parts and just yesterday you must have seen that president morsi has been given 20 years imprisonment in the case uh, come back please i didn't finish with that slide libya had a different narrative in the case of libya you had direct western intervention to effect regime change when the uprising occurred at benghazi it was put down very quickly and president gaddafi tried to ameliorate uh, try to reach out to his people and try to suggest that he would reform many things but before he could do that the western alliance saw a certain opportunity to effect regime change that while they had engaged with gaddafi for 7 years they had always found him a very uncomfortable partner a person who was prone to change his mind and therefore they could not guarantee that he would remain subservient to western interests as is a requirement of the western alliance therefore they engaged in military assault on a one particular day for 4 to 5 hours tripoli was bombarded between 30 to 50000 libyans were killed the regime was destroyed and finally the leader was executed the west had learned three lessons from afghanistan and iraq and those three lessons were the following number 1 don't put your own boots on the ground ensure that your war is fought by militia and that you are not seen as an occupation force number 2 co-opt the arab governments however modest and however cosmetic their role please ensure that they are with you as partners hence the arab league and the gcc issued resolutions supporting the western assault and even gave some token military support in the shape of two to four aircraft and third control the arab media bring them on your side al jazeera had actually ensured the western the, the degree of western destruction in baghdad and parts of iraq in gaza before that in lebanon today it was necessary that al jazeera was co-opted and that was done and today you find libya as a country is destroyed it has two separate governments it has 1500 militia it is awash with weaponry and it has now for the first time in the last few weeks seen the physical presence of the islamic state yemen yemen is a very peculiar system because it is inherently chaotic it has never had a strong central government it has people have enjoyed large degree of local autonomies but because the united yemeni population is more than that of saudi arabia the kingdom has always looked at yemen with deep concern as a security challenge and therefore saudi arabia has intervened consistently in manipulating the politics of yemen ali abdullah saleh and the saudi system 
had a certain synergy in terms of which Salafi elements became dominant in Yemen and therefore you find that and the local community which is known as Zaidi who used to be in the majority in North Yemen and were about 40 and are about 40 percent in the United Yemen were marginalized in the political order and felt deprived. They mobilized themselves in a movement called the Houthi movement named after their founder and as the, as the government became fragile, the government was changed. Ali Abdullah Saleh was forced to step down by the GCC and his vice president took, up, took over. But this was an extraordinary change. And I have called it regime change without change of regime. Because Ali Abdullah Saleh was allowed to stay on in the country. He was given amnesty. So he had every opportunity to continue to manipulate the political system and undermine his successor. And this is what happened. As the government of Rabbo was weakened day after day, had very little credibility, the Houthis, who had been a militia from 2004, finally struck, started capturing the northern provinces, entered Sana'a in September, October last year, and finally, under pressure from them, Rabbo fled to Aden, and from Aden he had gone to Riyadh. You have a very strange situation now that there is a pervasive Houthi militia in different parts of Yemen combating two forces, or three forces. Number one, forces which are still loyal to Rabbo. The Al-Qaeda, which is strong in the southern part of the country and is seeking to expand northwards. And you have a small secessionist movement in South Yemen which is seeking to restore the old South Yemen as an independent entity. It is in this scenario that the Saudis have decided to take military action against the Houthis and therefore they are bombing them from the air just as the Americans used to do other Arabs in Iraq, uh, uh, other Muslims in Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya. Today the Saudis are playing this role in Yemen. What happened in Bahrain was that Bahrain has a long history of demanding reform. It doesn't go, it goes back a hundred years. But even if you come to very modern times, in 2001, when the state became a kingdom, the ruler himself promised reform to his people. This reform included significant political reform, including the possibility of a constitutional monarchy. In 2011, under the influence of the Arab Spring, when people gathered at Pearl Square, there was no sectarian demand that was voiced at that time. And it was a mixed community that was agitating. And there was an actual dialogue between the crown prince and these agitators. And they seemed to be making progress. There was even a concern that they might concede to constitutional monarchy. That it, the only issue before them was the time frame and the circumstances in which this change would occur. It is at that time there was a split in the royal family and the prime minister appealed to Saudi Arabia to intervene and the Saudi forces entered Bahrain in the middle of March. 14, 15 March 2011 they intervened and that was the end of the agitation. Not only were all the agitators uh, rounded up and uh, dispersed, but the iconic Pearl Square symbol was also destroyed. The Pearl Square symbol is a symbol of GCG unity and in the process of dispersing that, they also got rid of this symbolic thing. Bahrain today, which used to be the most accommodative and the most moderate country in the Arab world, is today experiencing considerable repression and according to reports, human rights abuses. There is now widespread violence in different parts of the Arab world. In the case of Iraq, the history is not linked directly with the Arab Spring. It is linked, it begins with the, uh, with the, uh, with the American assault upon Iraq and the, and the breakup of the country and the unleashing of certain forces, some of them of a sectarian character. In the case of Syria, again, regime change became extremely important for the Saudis because, and this is important to understand from the perspective of Riyadh, that 
every development in West Asia since the U.S. assault upon Iraq has been seen at placing the Saudi, Saudi Arabia at a strategic disadvantage and privileging the Iranians. The Saudis saw, for example, Iranian influence expand in Iraq. They already had influence in Syria. They were already influential with Hamas. And the Saudis therefore decided, once Bahrain had this agitation and Hosni Mubarak had fallen, Hosni Mubarak was the strategic partner for Saudi Arabia and balanced Saudi Arabia vis-a-vis -vis Iranian power. Once Hosni Mubarak had fallen and a brotherhood government had replaced him and there was a demand for reform in Bahrain, which whatever the shape it took, it would certainly have empowered the 70% Shia community the Saudis decided that enough was enough. Any empowerment of Shia in, uh, in Bahrain would have had two implications. Number one, that the, the demand for reform would reverberate across the GCC. It would not remain confined to this little kingdom. Secondly, any empowerment of Shia would have its own impact upon the Shia communities across the GCC, but most importantly, the two million strong community in the eastern province at the Bahraini border. It is for this reason that the Saudis intervened militarily, but more than that, they took the next step. They decided to abandon the policies of behind the scene diplomacy and moderation in favor of a policy that was proactive, aggressive, and militant, military policy. They decided to make regime change in Syria as the most important aspect of this changed policy. If Bashar Assad was overthrown, the connection between Iran and Syria would be snapped and Iran would remain confined to the Gulf rather than have an outreach all the way to the Mediterranean. It would also be unable to sustain the Hezbollah. Therefore, Lebanon, once again, along with Syria, would join the mainstream Arab community. And the Saudis felt this would restore the balance of strategic disadvantage that they have been experiencing for so long. Things have not gone as they planned, because in Syria, it has not been easy to, to overthrow the regime. Firstly, the Saudis thought that they would use the free Syrian army, that with the help of checkbook, they would be able to bribe various elements of the Saudi, of the Syrian army, most of whom are Sunni, and would be able to get the, break the Syrian army in this way. It has not happened. The free Syrian army, so-called, is an ineffective force in Syria. In the meantime, Qatar and Turkey supported Salafi militia and seemed to be doing extraordinarily well. In this imbroglio, you found the penetration into Syria of this element that had been sustaining itself in Iraq, the Islamic State for, is, uh, for Iraq and uh, the Levant or Syria, Greater Syria, suddenly entered in the shape of Jabhat Nusra and later on as the ISIS itself. It is in this context that Saudi Arabia abandoned the Free Syrian Army, took over control of the Salafi militia and is now competing with the Jabhat Nusra and the ISIS against Bashar Assad. It is proving to be extremely difficult to unseat him, but it has meant the killing of 220,000 Syrian people. It has meant the destruction of almost all the major cities of Syria, and the country that we knew just a few years ago no longer exists. But the regime has not been toppled. Well, now, I, you know, everything in the region now has changed. The scenario that you had before and the scenario that has emerged in the last four years has been almost entirely overturned. The GCC, which used to be such a robust and united entity, is showing strains within itself. The proactive and aggressive Saudi policies have alienated a number of, uh, of members. Oman doesn't, is not accommodative of the aggressive policy relating to the, uh, to, I mean, you know, relating to the Iranians and to the Muslim Brotherhood. Oman is out. Kuwait is uneasy about this aggressiveness with regard to the Brotherhood and, 
and Iran and would like to play an accommodative role. In the case of Abu Dhabi, they are hostile to the Brotherhood but want to keep a certain connectivity with Iran. It is really speaking, you, uh, Qatar, which is totally against the activity, against the Brotherhood and is pursuing an Islamist line, you do not have the GCC in the same shape that it was before. Secondly, these relationships, the backbone of the strategic scenario in the region was the GCC relationship with the United States. That came under strain. Number one, the Saudis blamed the U.S. for not, ensure, for, for, uh, not preventing Hosni Mubarak's fall. Number one, I don't think they could have done much at that time, but the Saudis feel aggrieved that their friend was not protected. And number two, that these Americans did not carry out bombardment against Bashar Assad, even when there was evidence of chemical attack. It is in this context that there was a strain in the relationship. To complicate the situation further, the Americans have started engaging with the Iranians. Iranians were the sworn enemy of the Americans and the strategic rivals of Saudi Arabia. And here they find these two people are now engaged with each other and they seem to have a very comfortable relationship to the extent that they have made remarkable progress on the one issue that divided the West from Iran, and that is the nuclear matter. They seem to be doing quite well. This has alarmed Saudi Arabia and made it feel extremely uncomfortable that what is the kind of arrangement the Americans will make with the Iranians? Will there be a quote-unquote grand bargain in terms of which the Iranians will start playing a significant role in the region, just as they had done when the Shah of Iran was ruling that country. These are some of the issues that have come up. Unfortunately, with deep regret, one must note that the Saudi competitiveness with Iran has been imbued with a sectarian odor, a sectarian color. This is one of the most obnoxious aspects of the present scenario. The Saudi government will say that no official of theirs has ever spoken in sectarian terms. Maybe so. But what about their media? What about their scholars? The venom with which they write about Iran in sectarian terms and call it hegemonic because of the Safavid empire, which hardly anyone seems to recall, and I have challenged these Saudi scholars and GCC scholars by asking them which is the war that the Iranians ever initiated in the region in the last hundred years. The war against them was initiated by the Iraqis. They experienced chemical weapons at the hands of the Iraqis. In the case of Syria, it is the, it is the various Salafi militia that have been aggressive against Bashar Assad, not the Hezbollah not the Iranians. So there is, is this sectarianism is an aspect of the imbroglio in West Asia, which is of the deepest possible concern to all of us. And I remind my Saudi friends, and I must mention it to you here publicly, just as jihad was put together as state policy for short-term advantage in 1980-81, and its implications are still with us 35 years later, don't you think that sectarianism will also be with us for several years? And can any country in the world say that we are safe from sectarianism? Does not Saudi Arabia have two million people who are Shia? Therefore, this is something I believe is extraordinarily dangerous and the implications of this will be with us for many decades to come. Other, as other developments in the region pertain to the larger role that Turkey is playing a role that uh, Russia has started playing in a certain way. There is the resurgence of jihad. I had suggested to you that towards the end of the last decade, jihad was on the back burner. But the failure in Iraq, the collective failure of the different powers and the failure of the leadership of Nuri Maliki, who imparted a sectarian character to his political system, gave rise to a community which is today referred to as ISIS. It is a formidable community. It has emerged from Sunni grievances. 
Sunni sense of marginalization and disadvantage is today a formidable element. It controls territory, it has revenues, it has a military force, it has huge resources available to it and commands the richest agricultural land in the Arab world and also has a few wells available to it. It has a very highly motivated militia. It has a leadership that calls itself the Caliphate. The first Caliphate in the Muslim world after the demise of the Ottoman Sultan it has captured the imagination of large numbers of young people. People from the Arab world, people from the Western world are flocking to the Islamic State in huge numbers. I see the Islamic State primarily as an Iraqi phenomenon with some role in Syria. But today you find that they have a presence in Libya, they have assaulted uh, a target in Libya. You also have heard the other day that an affiliated community has also carried out a major assault in Afghanistan. I have a vision here which is horrendous. It is not like the vision of Martin Luther King, a vision of hope. This is a vision of despair. I see within the next five years or so a coming together of jihadi elements from Pakistan right across to Morocco where where Tehreek Taliban Pakistan, Lashkar e Tayyaba, Afghan Taliban, and the Islamic State, and various other entities, the Shabab and Boko Haram, and various others will coalesce. I do not, I do not suggest to you that they will be an integrated community. They will have substantial local autonomies. There will be much greater coordination between them. And this is going to be the most dangerous development that is possible in this region. And it is entirely a product of the failure of the regimes to reform and is a product of the strategic competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Where do we go from here? I have suggested to you about the ISIS. I believe that the backbone of this, the immediate way in which you can address the, uh, the, the deteriorating situation is to for the engagement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You don't see evidence of this just now. Occasionally you thought that they would come together, some words used to be exchanged, and but it has not happened. And most Concern, a matter of the deepest possible concern is this reference that you find in literature nowadays, the development of a Sunni front. It includes Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Turkey as a military force that is supposed to oppose the Iranian influence in this region. It has gained resonance after the successes of the Houthis, which again the Saudis in their paranoia see as an extension of Iranian influence. So they see themselves as strangled by the Shia crescent. So right across the region, when you sit in Riyadh, you feel this stranglehold of the Shia crescent upon you, stretching from Yemen, going to Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, you are strangled. And if you feel strangled, this is what you do. This is a completely foolish approach. I have suggested, I asked at a conference a few days ago, a few weeks ago, a very, very prominent Saudi about the Sunni front. His answer was completely different from what we have been reading in literature. He said Saudi Arabia is sensitive to geography. We are linked to Iran by geography. We cannot wish that away. We are linked to Iran by religion because we share the same belief in Allah and the Prophet Muhammad and in the Quran Sharif and that is something that is a bond between us. We have historical ties and Saudi Arabia does not support the Sunni front. But there may be other countries who do. He said that softly and left it at that. India is deeply concerned about what is happening. 80% of our oil comes from the Gulf, 50% from the GCC countries and the balance from Iran and Iraq. Over the next 35, 30 years, this dependence on the Gulf will increase significantly so that by the time you reach 2035, 2040, we will be 90% dependent on Gulf oil and Gulf will be selling 90% of its oil to Asia. So you have a very powerful, mutually dependent, 
have a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship that is emerging between the Gulf and Asia, led by India at the margins. The GCC is our number one trade partner. It is also the home. It is our major investment partner. In Hyderabad alone, you are familiar with many things that, the, uh, that are the product of investment from the UAE. And of course, we have 8 million Indians who live in the six countries of the GCC. These Indians, if each and every one of them supports just four people, you can imagine that 8 million plus 32 million, 40 million Indians are directly benefiting from the presence of this community that sends back to India every year $35 billion, more than a third of the oil bill of India. It is sent back to us. It also benefits 40 million. Let me give you some more figures. 50% of this community in the Gulf is from Kerala. 80% of the community is from the four countries, from the four southern states. The four southern states, have, including Andhra Pradesh, have a direct interest in the safety and welfare of their community. India, therefore, for the present and for the long term, needs a region that is secure and it is stable. Today, we have had a relationship of commercial character, some political character, it, we have never sought to play a strategic role in the region. It is a suggestion from me that the time has come to give up being a bystander and to play a role which is more active, not just on your own. Mobilize other countries of Asia, like China, Japan, and Korea, which with all their internal differences, share a, uh, an abiding interest in the security of the Gulf. I am going to say to you something which is not written anywhere in any book. It is my personal understanding. I believe the region is ripe for change. I believe that authoritarianism cannot continue. And the reasons are as follows. It's a product of deep research over 150 years literature over 150 years, and personal experience and interaction with several people, albeit of an anecdotal character. I believe that the desire for change, for political reform, is now an integral part of the psyche of the Arab people. Number two, the suggestion that used to be made earlier that somehow there is a contradiction between Islam and a democratic system has been largely erased. There is enough literature available today across the Arab world which sees no such contradiction whatsoever. And indeed, very often the demand for reform has come from within the heart of the establishment, including the Salafi establishment. There is also, there used to be another contradiction, or you could say divide. There used to be a group in the Arab community who were called the secular liberals. And there was another community who were called Islamists. You find today, increasingly, their agenda is similar. To the extent of 90 to 95 percent in Saudi Arabia, the Sahwa, which is from the Wahhabi establishment, and the secular liberals share several things in common. Constitutionalism, constitutional monarchy, human rights, uh, and then free elections, an elected parliament, a prime minister from the parliament, cabinet responsibility to the house, respect for human rights. There are two issues which these two groups have put on the back burner for the, sign, for the time being. One pertains to women. There is, of course, in traditional Islam, there is a view that women are complementary of men and that their primary role should be to nurture the family and to care for children. But the Tunisian constitution doesn't get into this debate whatsoever. And it says that men and women are equal. The Saudis have decided to put it on the back burner for the time being. The second is the issue, the, the divide with regard to Shia. 
deep in the Wahhabi establishment are concerns relating to Shia. And it is here that they have, there are elements, there are leaders within the Saudi establishment, Wahhabi establishment, who are part of the reform movement, who feel that sh the Shia should be seen as an integral part of the Islamic community, the world over, Salman Oda, for example. I am optimistic with regard to both these. Once they get the challenge of governance, there is no reason to believe. I've also added one more point, that the reform discourse is diverse and creative. And I want to share with you why I say this. I read somewhere that an, a Moroccan Salafi scholar said that in the Quran Sharif there is reference to dignity, karama. And the dignity is seen as an important aspect, as an extremely important aspect of the human being. But how does a human being get dignity unless he is free? Therefore, he must flourish in a democratic order. This is what I call creative thinking. I've also, uh, finally, I will say that the democratic discourse is now totally indigenized. Ten years ago, when I wrote my first book, Reform in the Arab World, uh, the subtitle was External Influences and Regional Debates. If I were to write the book now, I would erase the portion external influences. The Arab world no longer needs external influences. The entire discourse of liberalism and of democracy is now an integral part of Arab discourse. It does not have any foreign. Uh, I have written, I believe also that the kingdom is likely to seek reform sooner rather than later. I believe that this is the case. Firstly, the Sahaba movement is from within the Wahhabiyya, so there is no contradiction between them. You can be against the Ikhwan, but you cannot be against your own people who have been taught in your schools and colleges and are central to Wahhabi discourse. Also, you have been extremely harsh with the Wahhabi, with these scholars, with Sahaba scholars demanding reform. But you've been harsh on them for 20 years and they have not died away, they have not gone away. You've given them large imprisonments, long imprisonments. Today there are 20 to 30,000 Saudi scholars who are in jail. But they have not given up their movement. Their movement may be at the moment virtual. It's not something that you can end. My last point to you in this regard is that I am confident that elements of the next generation of the royal family will see advantage in gradual, slow, moderate, top-down reform experience of elections at provincial level, partially at Shura Council, ministerial responsibility, greater freedom of speech and expression, better control of the lunatic elements in the, in the Mutawa element, Mutawa community. All of these, I believe, if only to safeguard the continued relevance of their royal family, I believe there is hope. And I will end with this last quotation. This is a quotation from Jamal Khashoggi. Agla slide, yeah. This appeared, this Jamal Khashoggi is one of the most distinguished scholars and journalists of Saudi Arabia. He has been close to the Faisal family. He was editor of Wat Al Watan. And just see what he has to say. And with that, thank you very much.